Um, over the last two weeks, we have been talking about the Holy Spirit. We mentioned in the first week that the Holy Spirit has always been. There was not a time before or at creation that the Holy Spirit did not exist. He was always. Just as it says in Revelation that Jesus Christ is the beginning and the end, the Holy Spirit has been there from the beginning. If we look back to the first week, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, that being the Holy Spirit, hovered over the face of the waters. So, the Holy Spirit was always there. Remember, it mentions in Genesis as well, let us make man in our image. That is a conversation that is going on between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit on how to and what man should look like. We are made in the image of God. I think that's pretty darn cool. I do. Remember something. The Holy Spirit has always been involved in the work of creation and recreation, transformation. If we think about the renewing of our minds, when we come to Christ, we, we come to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We believe, we repent, we ask our Heavenly Father to forgive us of our sins, and then we receive. In that moment, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us, and He begins to do a work inside of our heart. He works from the inside out. And this has never changed from the beginning of time. We say, well, the Holy Spirit's not in the Old Testament. Oh, uh-uh. Well, we spoke about that the first and second week as well. Holy Spirit was there. Listen to what David says in Psalm 51, verses 10 and 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. I need to not conform to the pattern of the world anymore, but be transformed with the renewing of my mind, and then I'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to come in, move about, and sometimes that transformation can be a little uncomfortable. It can be a little unsettling. But when God starts to move things around, even if it's difficult, we can still see that there's goodness. Somehow, some way, God will use whatever is in our life for good. He will. David goes on to say, Cast me not away from your presence and take not, listen, take not from me your Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's always been there. The Holy Spirit's not just a figurative thing. He is a person, third person of the Trinity. And if we look back at the last two weeks, we can just consider some of the things that the Holy Spirit wants to do, has done, and will continue to do. So this morning, let's just look at a few things about the Holy Spirit, and then we can wrap this up next week with some of the greatest things, I believe. The Holy Spirit is very intentional. He doesn't do things by just happenstance or coincidence or say, oh, I need to change my mind. God doesn't change his mind. God is constant. He doesn't. He's always working in the behalf of the believer of those, you know, those who follow his will. You know, I can hear from God, and he can show me a direction he wants me to go in my life, but I say, oh, God, I know what you want me to do, but can I tell you a better way to do it? He's not going to be favorable. He's not going to look favorably upon that. He's not. We, if we stand within the will of God and show willfulness, willfulness, the giving up of ourselves, the hum humbling before our mighty God to his will, we show discretion in that, then he shows us love. And he communicates with us. And then we can testify of what God is doing in our life. And God will teach us, the Holy Spirit will teach us, and then we can teach others. And we can pray to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's praying for us to our Heavenly Father. And we can pray for others. You see the circle of greatness that surrounds the Holy Spirit. 
not only in God's Word, but in our life. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 20 says this, You gave your good spirit to instruct them, and you did not withhold your manna from their mouth, and you gave them water for their thirst. The Spirit was there with Nehemiah. John 15, 26, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from my Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness to me. He will bear witness to me. You have proof living inside of your heart who God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is. You are also to testify to the greatness of God in your life. It says be prepared in 1 Peter 3.15 to give an account of what God's done in your life, but you do it with gentleness and humbleness. Again, humility comes up a whole lot in Scripture, and we don't like to think about that. We like to think about being in control of our own lives and our own destiny. Again, we don't tell God what's best for us because the truth is this. God knows our heart better than we do. He does. He knows us far better than we know ourselves, And God knows what's best for us. He knows what's best. Acts 13, 22. Or excuse me, 13, 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barabbas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Can I just tell you something about this verse? God has said that every person who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But he's also said everyone who calls on the name of the Lord and will be saved should go out into the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That means that we must be equipped. We must be ready and have wisdom and knowledge that comes from God in heaven to be able to teach those about God's saving grace. Can I tell you something about Barnabas and Saul? You know why? They were set apart. One word, they were willing. They were willing. They said, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. There was an air of meekness in these two men, although they sometimes didn't agree. As a matter of fact, they got in an argument about whether John Mark should go with one or the other at one point. And Paul said, he's not going with me. You take him. And Barnabas said, well, he's going to be a benefit to me. So God works in ways sometimes we just don't understand. But we must be willing. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11 says this, All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit. One and the same Spirit. Who will portions, who gives portions to each each one individually as he wills see some are called to teach some are called to preach some are called to pray some are called to encourage some are called to be an encouragement hold one another accountable love one another we're all called to love one another but the truth is this this, when we see our brother and sister in Christ in need if they're going through a trial in their life we should be willing to remind them that no matter what they're going through in this moment God still loves them and we are here for you we're going to walk with this trial we're going to walk with you in this trial we're going to stand by your side and it may be different from now on But we're going to remind you every day that God loves you. I can tell you, in some of the darkest points in my life, I had good brothers in Christ who were willing to encourage me on a regular basis. I've shared this story with you before about a man named Chuck. Lord bless Chuck. My goodness, those of you who knew Chuck, he was, uh, I like to call Chuck a live wire. But boy, was he sold out for Jesus Christ. He didn't have much of a filter. But he would tell you that Jesus loves you, and he loved you too. And he didn't have to tell you, but he did. He didn't have to tell you. He showed it. I can remember one morning in one of the darkest points of my life, I got a phone call about 8 o'clock in the morning. And I said, good morning. And I knew who it was, but I didn't want to say, hey, Chuck, how are you doing today? I was all wrapped up in my mess. 
And Chuck said, how are you doing this morning? I said, Chuck, I'll be honest with you, I'm struggling. He said, who's your father? And I didn't see much humor in that question at that point. There were a lot of things I just didn't want to talk about in my life. I said, Chuck, I'm, I'm not in the mood for, for semantics or silly things this morning. He just said, no. Think about what I just asked you. He said, who's your father? I said, it's Jesus. It's God the Father in heaven. He said, so what's your problem? He said, Ray, whatever is pushing you down right now, God's still your father. That's not going to change. God's still going to lift you up. God's still going to hold on to you. God's still going to carry you when you can't walk. And I never forgot that conversation. Never forgot it, and I never will. We need to remind one another. See, Chuck, he, he couldn't quote verses verbatim. He had very little memory of verses uh, verbatim. He lived them. He lived them. And I think that's far more important as a believer in Jesus Christ to the world around us. I do. We need to understand a few things other about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was also present throughout the entire life of Jesus on a personal level. Okay? When Gabriel appealed to, appeared to Mary, the mother of Jesus, to let her know that she was going to give birth to the Savior of the world, Gabriel says this, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High. Who's the Most High? God Almighty, Yahweh, our Father in heaven, will overshadow you. The Holy Spirit of the Most High will overshadow shadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy. He'll be called the Son of God. Gabriel answered Mary's question by saying this, it's the power of the highest in the person. Yes, remember, the person of the Holy Spirit that will overshadow you. Overshadow means to cover. It's like throwing a sheet over someone, except with one exception. If you have a sheet thrown over you, you can't see where you're going. You know, as a little kid, you may have dressed up like a ghost or something like that and threw a sheet over your head. And if you didn't cut out the little eye holes, you'd run into walls and everything else. You'd trip and fall. Well, here's something about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit covers you. He overshadows you, but you can see clearer. Those rose-colored glasses come off. It's like wearing sunglasses inside. You can't see very well. Well, with the Holy Spirit, he puts on magnifying glasses so that you can't trip and you shouldn't fall. But when you do, Jesus is there to pick you up. It's the same appearance, overshadowing, that we find in the book of Exodus. An overshadowing with Listen, in that time, in Exodus, it was a cloud. But that cloud was called the Shekinah glory of God. The Shekinah glory. That means God's glory seen to the best of our ability in its perfection. The Shekinah glory of God. In Exodus 16.10, it says this, The glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. Exodus 40, 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, the tabernacle. And listen, then the glory of the Lord filled that tabernacle, just as it did when Isaiah walked into the temple, and he was followed by a cloud of smoke. And then the Holy Spirit surrounded Isaiah. And then the Holy Spirit, God's glory, God's Shekinah glory, said, Whom shall I send? Remember, we're all called. We're called. We teach, we preach, we encourage, we love one another. And then Isaiah jumps up and screams, send me, send me. Can I tell you something? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living in your heart. That should arouse an excitement in your life that nothing else should contain. You should be overjoyed with the fact that you have a Savior that cares about your needs, 
who loves you unconditionally when you seek his will for your life. And he wants you to proclaim that name and fame, to be a salt and preservative to a dying world around the world. On the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 7, it says this in verse 5. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Here's that cloud again. And it overshadowed. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Jesus took Peter, James, and John to the top of the mountain of transfiguration. And Eli and Moses appeared to them. And here comes Peter. I have to say that Peter always had foot and mouth disease. He could not keep his foot out of his mouth. He always tended to think in his early years much less than he spoke. You ever feel that way? But I'll tell you something that's interesting about Peter as he grew closer to the Lord, the wisdom became greater. The wisdom from God, the knowledge from God, and Peter tended to speak less and listen more. And the words that he spewed were from God. Wiser and wiser as time went on. But here we see Peter caught up in excitement. And he says, hey, let's erect a temple. Let's erect tents to worship Elijah and Moses. And God says, no, that's not the point. You are here to see that my son, with whom I'm well pleased, is set apart. He's separate. He's unique. And while we have a prophet who proclaimed the things that would come in the future days, Elijah, and we have a keeper of the law, the writer of the law, Moses, standing here with you today, we have one who created the law. And his his name is Jesus Christ. The one who was and is and is to come, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is set apart. He is unique. And he is to be worshipped. He is to be worshipped alone. And God did this from a cloud that overshadowed them, the same cloud that can overshadow you today. Friends, the Holy Spirit overshadows every single believer, those who call on the name of the Lord. His manifestation has never changed. He is our comforter. He is our counselor. He is our teacher. He is our healer. He is our provider. He is our banner on the battlefield. And he will overshadow you and cover you and protect you when you feel like you can't walk on. And we are to give God the Father and God the Son glory and worship them alone. The Holy Spirit was also present at Jesus' baptism. When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. Well, there's something different. Not a cloud, but something physical. Although a cloud's physical in some sense, you can drive through the clouds in the mountains if you're high enough, but you can't drive through a dove. I hope. But we see here a dove descending on him and coming to rest on him, Matthew 3.16. Here's something important you need to notice. Let me tell you how great that celebration was in heaven that day, that Jesus was baptized. He stepped into God's obedient will for his life. The heavens opened. The heavens opened. This was important to God, that Jesus did this very thing. And again, Jesus is set apart. Now, Jesus was perfect. Jesus never sinned. He never sinned. He was not born like you and I. And we can talk about that in just a minute. There was a virgin conception. We'll speak about that in a moment. God was born, our Heavenly Father, excuse me, Jesus Christ, born perfect. Perfect. So did Jesus have to be baptized? Mm. I say yes. It's part of what God asks us to do. And Jesus, listen to me. Do I have to be baptized? When I come to believe and I repent? 
We're saved by faith through grace. Faith alone by grace alone. But God says you are to give an outward expression. Stepping into those waters of baptism. An outward expression of the inward change that I'm making in your life. So yes, we are 100% supposed to be baptized. First step into God's obedient will. First step. And I can just tell you this. Let's make it real short. If it's good enough for Jesus, it should be good enough for you. Let's move on. The Holy Spirit could be also seen in this material form. Remember the form like a dove. During Jesus' ministry, he taught about the Holy Spirit repeatedly. And Jesus had an ongoing intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. And friends, you can too. He urged his disciples to receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came and rested upon them. On the day of Pentecost. And it says that about 3,000 were added to the numbers that day. The Holy Spirit works through evangelism. The Holy Spirit works through evangelism. In Acts 1-5 it said, For John baptized with water, but you will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. Speaking about what Jesus would do. And how he would accomplish his work on earth. Like a dove, the work of the Holy Spirit can be swift as well. You know, when I do weddings and they're done outside, a lot of times we'll do a dove release. And the reason why we do this dove release during a marriage is because doves have their mate for life. They have their mate for life. Boy, what a great example. Doves don't get divorced. There's a novel thought. But when that dove is released, man, it, huh, the, 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 the groom-to-be and the wife-to-be, they let go of those doves and they kind of raise them up in the air. They take off like a rocket. And where I do these dove releases so many times, it's at a place north of Win- in north in Winston-Salem. There is a home for those pigeons on the property. Well, guess where those pigeons or those doves go? They go home. They go home. The Holy Spirit can direct you where home is. This is not your home. This is not your home. This is a temporal home. This is boot camp. Right now, you're being prepared for what eternity will be like. How well will you fare? Do you want a peace that passes all understanding? Do you want instruction that will be harmless that comes from the counselor and the comforter, the teacher, the Holy Spirit. God's willing to give it to you. Are you willing to listen? And let the Spirit of God direct you home. And one day you can stand in front of your Heavenly Father. You can stand in front of Jesus Christ and He will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Or you'll stand in front of Him and He'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. There's one of two things that will happen. One of two things that will happen. It says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I can promise you one thing. If you've ever known someone who was not saved, who had not accepted Jesus Christ into their heart, if they would come back today and stand up here with me, they would ask you, do you know Jesus? That's what they would ask you. You know why? Because one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And they wish they would have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they look back and wish they would have accepted and received the Holy Spirit into their heart. Where do you stand in light of eternity? Where do you stand? The Holy Spirit cares about that. When you turn your back on the Holy Spirit, remember the Holy Spirit is grieved. But the Holy Spirit will also leap for joy. And the heavens will open when you receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works in the life of every single believer. The Holy Spirit, again, as we talked about last week, prays for us. He's subject to intense prayer, and he is the subject of intense prayer. Jesus emphasized that the Spirit was a necessary part of the Trinity, 
Again, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're three in one. In John 14, 16, he says this, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Jesus said this as he mentioned a predicted death one more time. And he did this to comfort his disciples, to give them reassurance, I will not be with you forever in the physical sense. But my spirit will never depart from you if you ask for it. And the world is unable to receive it because it doesn't see it. It doesn't see him and it doesn't know him. That's unbelievers. That's those who stand in front of God one day and they wish they would have accepted Jesus Christ. But then Jesus goes on to say, but you, you do know him. Again, I'm going to ask you, where do you stand in light of eternity? It's your choice to decide whether you go to heaven or hell. Your choice. God doesn't make that decision for you. You either are willing to receive or you're willing to turn your back on God. He says, he who remains with you. Because he remains with you. The Holy Spirit will remain with you. He's not going to leave you or forsake you. He remains with you. And he will be in you. I think the Lord makes some good points. I think Jesus really he kind of sets this verse, this passage apart. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit always was. Remember. And he's about to come. The Holy Spirit was. And he's about to come. Because Jesus is not going to be here in the physical form much longer. The time, the Spirit, this time the Spirit dwelt with the disciples. But they lacked having them, the Holy Spirit in them. They lacked having the Holy Spirit in them. If the Spirit of God is so important to the life of Jesus, can I ask you a question? How much more is the Holy Spirit important to you? We don't have Jesus with us today in the physical sense. He doesn't walk with us and teach us. But you can have the Holy Spirit to lead you, guide you, and direct you. That's important. Remember, the Holy Spirit moved about the face of the waters in Genesis. But he also moves about in Revelation. From beginning to end, he, remember, prays for you and intercedes for you. So you, the church, the bride of Christ, and the Holy Spirit cry with the same voice. You cry out to God in the very same way. When you can't muster the words, the Holy Spirit will give them to you. When you can't speak them or utter them, the Holy Spirit will speak for you. From beginning to end, he's always been active. In the beginning, created, was there the part of the creation. And no, it was not a big bang. Hey, surprise. God created the heavens and the earth in seven days, and he spoke those things into existence until he came to man, and then he stooped down into the dirt and made man in his image. And he got down close and breathed life, breathed breath into Adam's nostrils. He does the same for you today. He created you in your mother's womb. He ordained every day for you. Why should any of this be shocking to you? That he would comfort you, that he would help you, guide you, and teach you. None of these things should come to shock. That he will counsel you and intercede for you and be your advocate. He will be your lawyer in heaven's throne room when you ask for forgiveness. Your advocate. These things shouldn't take you by surprise. There's no area of your life in which the Holy Spirit can't work. If you ask him to, he will and so without the Holy Spirit, it's impossible to build the body of Christ. It's impossible. A gospel with no emphasis on the Holy Spirit is a flat-lined gospel. It has no heartbeat. You're missing one of the three most important pieces. You're missing the third person in the Trinity. In certain moments when there are special manifestations of God in the New Testament, it emphatically states that we are the partakers, the partakers, and we are filled with the Holy Spirit. 
then if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, then we can most certainly convey to others what Christ is doing and has done in our lives. John the Baptist was full of the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. And I think that's so important. It says when Mary came to visit Elizabeth, and she said that she was with child, and that she had gotten a visit from that wonderful angel Gabriel, and who the child was going to be. It says that the child in Elizabeth's womb leaped for joy. The Holy Spirit living in your heart should leap for joy, should be ecstatic. You should be ecstatic to know that you are so dearly loved and treasured by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he led by, he led by his Father's Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The disciples were filled with the Spirit in the upper room, and Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he stood up and preached on Pentecost. And remember, 3,000 were added to the number that day. That was a revival. I wonder, I'm just going to wonder for one second, if every one of you preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to someone this week, I wonder how many empty seats we would have. Can I take a stab? I'm going to say maybe none. I'm going to suggest that if you allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you, that in time we could take out part of those back walls and push them out and put in more seats. What are you willing to let the Holy Spirit do through you? Hey, 3,000 were added to the number that day when Jesus preached, or when Peter pe preached Pentecost. And he didn't say a whole lot. He spoke for just a few moments. Read it, Acts chapter 2. He spoke for about five or six minutes. So then you're going to ask, well, why are you still talking, Pastor Ray? <laughs> We're going to close this out here briefly. Stephen was also filled with the Holy Spirit. One of my favorite passages. It doesn't get any better than this. While they're stoning Stephen, and by the way, Paul, who used to be Saul, he was standing there. As a young Pharisee, he was holding the coats of those who were stoning Stephen to death. Now, this was before what I like to call Paul's come to Jesus meeting on the road to Damascus. And then he received the Holy Spirit on a street called Straight. Ah. I love the way that God uses words to make his point. But Stephen being filled with the Holy Spirit and looks up and sees heaven opened again because Stephen had just got finished telling the Pharisees who Jesus Christ was, that he was the Messiah, he was the Savior of the world. And he did it with a holy boldness that nothing could compare a holy boldness that you should have. Speak with fervence and boldness with the Holy Spirit speaking through you the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, saving grace. But as they're stoning Stephen to death, he looks up and the heavens are opened and he sees, I see Jesus, my Savior, standing at the right hand of the Father. Standing. Any other time you look in Scripture, it says Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. This is the one time. Even when God the Father is going to say one day, Son, I've had enough. This world is coming to an end. It's over. Go get my children. He's sitting. But that day, He's standing. Again, I encourage you to read Acts chapter 7, the story of Stephen. It's not about the stoning. It's about the glory. The glory of God. 
and the power of the Holy Spirit that worked through Stephen leading up to this. Jesus is standing at the right hand of the Father. And he says to Stephen, that's my boy. That's my boy. He just proclaimed the truth of the gospel. And now he's suffering for it. And I'm going to stand here and wait for him to get to the gates of heaven. And I'm going to welcome him home. And when you have the Holy Spirit living in your heart, when you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's no turning back. There's no looking back. You don't have to live with regrets or shame any longer. And you have the promise of hope and eternity living in your heart. There's no, I think I'm going to go to heaven or I pray I'm going to heaven. It's I know I'm going to see my king one day, my Savior, and his name is Jesus. You'll never be filled with doubts again because the Holy Spirit again will comfort you and counsel you. Will lift you up and encourage you. You can serve with a willingness and a desire to. I get to give back to others what God has given me because the Holy Spirit now resides within me. I am one part of many parts of a body of believers. You don't have to wonder any longer, but you can stand in confidence in God's obedient will for your life. But here's where it starts. It starts with, in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it says, If you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Christ was raised from the dead, then you will be saved. For it's with your mouth that you confess, and it's your heart that you believe. It's your heart. <clears throat> Talk can be cheap. It has to be both. You can't just say, yeah, I believe Jesus Christ was a real guy. I believe he walked on the earth. No, you have to believe in your heart that he's the son of God and he came to seek and save that which was lost. And I am going to follow him even if it means being persecuted. Hurt, stoned, mocked, made fun of, lied about. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. I'm going to stand with a holy boldness in my heart because the Holy Spirit now resides in me. Jesus Christ lives in my heart. And he's forever changed me. And he's transformed me. And he's made me into a new creation. I can take off the old suit and put on a new one. My wife probably wishes I wouldn't buy any more suits. But it's not this new suit. It's the new clothes around your heart and in your heart. And can I tell you something? If Jesus gives it to you, it's tailored. <laughs> it's going to be the best fitting suit you've ever worn. Are you willing? Where do you stand in light of eternity? Where do you stand? Do you stand in confidence? Or do you just hope? Or do you just pray? Or do you think? If you haven't asked Christ into your heart, then today's the day that you do that. You settle it for time and eternity. You settle it for eternity. Yes, I'm going to glory. And Jesus is going to meet me at the gates one day. Well, maybe you feel like that <clears throat> there's been a gap between you and God for a while. Maybe, maybe you've put up some walls. Maybe you let weeds grow in the garden. Well, you know what? Get out the weed whacker. Get busy. Get rid of the weeds. Pull up the thorny bushes. Tear down the wall. At least open a window so you can hear the gospel. How about that? And step into God's obedient will once again for your life. And here's what it takes. Lord, forgive me. I have fallen short. Believe that you're the Son of God. 
You bled and died so that I can be saved from my sins. You willingly gave up your life for me. You say that and you believe it in your heart. You believe in your heart and you say that you were buried in, but you resurrected more importantly. Your Father in heaven took you out of that grave and my guilt and my shame stu- stayed in that grave and you walked out in your glory. The glory of God, Shekinah glory. That's why it was unrecognizable when you walked out of the tomb. That's why when he came to the disciples in the upper room, they didn't recognize him at first. Mary didn't recognize him in the garden. He was in his full glory. You have that opportunity to see your Savior face to face one day. But it's your choice. Maybe you're looking for a church home. We would love for you to be a part of First Christian Church, the Clemens.